Amen and amen. You hear some extra wiggles. Predominantly, that is our one-year-old Judah. But I know some of you have them with you as well. Please don't let that uh, make you feel uncomfortable. Jesus said, let the children come. We say the same here. Kiddos, this is the time you get that sidewalk chalk out. Pull that black butcher paper covered table close to your lap. And what we want you to do during this time, and adults, you can do it too. Don't, Don't have any shame here. This is a safe place. Make the most of this time as God is speaking to you. Make the most of this time as God is speaking to you. And children, thank you Judah, and children specifically, I want you all to listen to words that you might hear me say. I want you to listen to words we might read from the Word of God. Write things down from what God's speaking to your heart about. Draw pictures. Um, Be as creative and fun as you want. And we'd love to post those on social media and celebrate all that God is doing in your life as he's speaking his weekly message to his people in this setting. I want to invite you to open up your copy of God's Word this morning to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, we're going to be looking at those 20 verses. As you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. And I want to prepare you for this question. As I ask this question, if your answer to this question is the affirmative, if it's a yes to this question, I want to hear a hearty amen. Not just a ho-hum, amen, a hearty like you've been dying to see some live sports, amen. Okay, so we're going to practice because I know you might need a little practice. You're the late service. You're just rolling out of bed, okay? Give me a hearty amen, amen? Amen. Y'all are louder than the first service. That is awesome. Here's the question. Yes, and the children follow. That is so seriously, so sweet. Here's the question. When it comes to listening, When it comes to listening, would you say there is a difference between listening and only hearing what's been shared? Between listening and actually fully understanding what's been shared. Would you say yes to that? Okay, good. I mean, it's whether you said yes or not, it's a matter of fact that there is a difference there. So you can have your opinions, you would have been wrong, but that is a matter of fact, okay? There's a great difference between listening and simply hearing something versus listening and fully comprehending and accepting and embracing the message that has been shared. And there's something else when it comes to listening that really bugs me. Uh, I feel safe confessing this in this place. I think it bugs some of you as well, I'm sure. Um, I don't know about you. I have some people in my life that when I share something to them, No matter how clear it's articulated, no matter how slow and loud I speak, for whatever reason, they have an instant, automatic reply no matter what. For example, and and maybe you have some people like this too. Maybe maybe you work with them. I don't know. For example, if I were telling some of you on our front row this morning, hey, did you hear this last week how God of all creation divinely orchestrated the exposure of of the evil empire New York Yankees being more corrupt than our beloved Astros. Yeah. Woo! There we go with some amens. If I said that, there's no doubt you just heard that. There's no doubt that was slow enough, articulate enough. You heard me say that. But there's some people in our lives, no matter how clear, no matter how slow something's communicated, as soon as I'm finishing my breath to speak, they instantly and automatically respond with, what? You know anybody like that? Hey, did you hear about the news yesterday? What? Hey, let me slowly communicate something to you. I know you're hearing this. Can you tell me yes if you hear me? What? And they say it like that. Y'all know anybody like that? Maybe you're married to somebody like that. We're, We're very intentional with our kiddos. You don't yell out what? You don't yell out, sir or ma'am. Well, daddy, I I didn't hear you. Well, wait a minute, child. I I think what you meant to say is, hey, daddy, I heard you. I I got the sense that you needed something and you were trying to share something with me. And I heard you all the way upstairs and you all the way in the backyard. I heard you, daddy. But I didn't fully understand what you were saying. Now we're getting somewhere. Mark chapter 4 today. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is doing something very similar among his disciples, among the the massive crowds that are following him in search of life and hope and transformation that this world doesn't offer, 
He is telling them, listen here, there's a spiritual truth that I don't want you just to simply hear or be aware of or give me the what to. I want you to hear it and accept it. Fully receive what I'm sharing with you. It falls in line with the title you see here, what you've seen in the digital bulletin. So the word. Based on Jesus' teaching, finding the appropriate placement for God's word in our lives. Where his word truly is sown into our lives. Truly where his word, living, active, sharper than any double-edged sword, is planted within our lives with growth, thriving, and vitality. So we open up in Mark 4. We're not going to read it all ahead of time. I'm going to walk through it verse by verse. Check out the first couple verses. Chapter 4. Again, he, pronoun being Jesus, began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him. So that Jesus got into a boat, sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And Jesus was teaching them Many things in parables. So the setting here, as you might be familiar, the Sea of Galilee, major fishing industry, also referred to in different scripture accounts as the Lake of Guinness Eret, a large body of water. It's actually a lake, um, fresh water, but it's just so massive, it's referred to as a sea as well. Something interesting here is um, the boat that Jesus got into. Remember, this is the gospel according to Mark, but it's not Mark's firsthand knowledge, but it's Mark taking the accounts of Peter, inscribing them into his own gospel account. Peter being a fisherman, his brother Andrew and John and James, um, the, the sons of Zebedee, they're all in the fishing industry. And they knew their boats inside and out. And Peter makes a distinction here about the boat. Jesus is not just getting in a small little rowboat or a canoe. He's in a vessel that is too large to row up and back to shore. Jesus would have had to load on this boat he was getting onto to teach from, from a dock or a pier. Or most likely, it was one of the disciples hopping Jesus in a transport, smaller rowboat, taking him out there to a larger vessel. So, so as if this were the land with all the, the crowds pressing into Jesus, he took the little rowboat and hopped in this larger vessel, found him a seat, going to these very intentional links in his grace to communicate the teaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And it says he was teaching with a very specific style. It said he's teaching the many things in parables. Well, what's significant about that? Well, parables, it's a, a term, literally two words put together. Para, you might know from parallel, parallel lines, come alongside one another, they come beside one another. And the other part of the word parable means to throw or to cast out. So literally, this style of teaching Jesus was doing from this large vessel from the Sea of Galilee was the throwing out of illustrative stories alongside one another, different stories and scenarios, so that as they were thrown out alongside one another, the comparisons they drew could highlight different points that Jesus wanted to communicate. And getting to the end of chapter, uh, verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3, in his teaching, Jesus said to them, this, these were the very first words he said, listen, behold. He basically says, hey, up here, heads up, pay attention, wake up, don't miss this. It's interesting, in the, the first nine verses of chapter four, in four different ways, Jesus says something to the extent of, I need your attention, you don't want to miss this. I mean, it's a special story, special opportunity. Uh, imagine you're, experiencing three months of quarantine as a result of global pandemic. Is that hard to imagine? Anybody know that? And imagine you've been binge watching every night a certain Netflix or Hulu TV series, and you've made it through all quarantine without things being spoiled or the ending ruined, and you finally come to the series finale. What are you going to do to give your undivided attention to that? You're going to dim the lights to your liking. You're going to turn the volume up where it's shaking the walls or just... Not quite knocking the pictures off the wall, but loud enough. If you have kids, you're going to lock them in a room where you can't hear them, even if it's WrestleMania 27 in their bedroom. You're going to give it all attention you can because you know something profound is coming. And that's the same way with the parable style that Jesus was teaching with. 
He threw these illustrative stories alongside one another. And as they were compared to one another, situated within these stories was profound, life-altering, eternity-changing truth. So it's easy to understand why he's like, hey, don't miss what I'm about to share. So then we have a story from verses 4 to 9 that he cast out there alongside one another. And this is what it is. He said, Behold, a sower went out to sow. Verse 4. And as Jesus sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. It yielded no grain. Check out verse 8. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100 Fold. And then verse 9, closing out this parable, Jesus taught, he says this, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Helen Keller, she said the only thing worse than being blind would be to have actual eyes for sight, but have no vision. Helen Keller was born in 1880. She could speak, she could hear, she could see. She spoke her word before her first birthday. But then at 19 months old, she got an illness, either meningitis or scarlet fever. And never again was she able to hear. Never again was she able to see. As a result, she was also unable to speak. But what she was meaning in this quote was how more tragic it would be than physically being blind if you actually had the eyesight, the, the eyes to function as the tool to provide sight but you didn't have the vision, you didn't have the ability in your mind's eye to, to capture and process that which you were viewing before you. As I look at verse 9, I can't help but think Helen Keller must have taken a, a play right out of Jesus' playbook. Because here in verse 9, that's what Jesus is emphasizing to his disciples, to the crowds there at the Sea of Galilee. He's saying this, the only thing worse than being deaf would be if you had hearing, if you had ears to hear, but you had no ability to truly understand to that message which you are listening to. He who has ears, let him hear. And the disciples, they were catching on to this. They realized, there was, man, this story Jesus just shared, there's obviously some, some gravity, some weight to it. So when the first opportunity presented itself behind closed doors, uh, of course, they said, Jesus, we realize you wanted us to, to hear and understand something. Hey, Jesus, we heard you that there's something you want us to, to know, but we just heard you. We didn't really understand you. What are you talking about? What do you really mean by this? And think about it. Up to this point of Jesus' ministry, he'd really been speaking straightforward with the truths he'd been um, providing. It, it was what's known as proverbial truth, a lot more easier to understand. But now, at this point, and almost exclusively um, from here on out for Jesus' ministry, parables. These illustrative stories coming alongside one another, comparing back and forth with a profound truth. The disciples are like, we're not used to this. What is this? Help us understand. Verse 11 and verse 12, Jesus replies. And Jesus said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven i know when you hear something like that from jesus it doesn't seem very loving does it at least at first glance that phrase those two verses from jesus does not seem very gracious does not sound like the Merciful, wonderful Savior we sing about and learn about and, and have grown to love. But think about the context of Jesus' ministry here. Most recently, the national religious leadership, they had done all they could to reject Jesus publicly, privately, 
um, trying to come up with different plans of sabotage to, to reject him. Saying Jesus has come saying he's the one. John the Baptist came preparing the way saying he's the one. No, Jesus is not the one. What did they say about our Jesus? They said he doesn't fit our mold. They said, no, he, he's proclaiming to be Messiah, the anointed one. But, but no, he, he's not willing to, to bow and contort himself in accordance with our religious preferences and rituals and traditions. This leadership had a hardness of heart. And what Jesus knew, because he's God, what we know with the privilege of looking back into the scriptures, many of these leaders had no sincere intention of ever believing or receiving what Jesus was offering. So as a result, what Jesus was describing here in verses 11 and 12 is his teaching style within his ministry took a shift shifted from proverbial truth to these parables because within parables truth is revealed but only to the extent to which a man's heart is humble and sincerely trusting in faith listen here it's it has nothing to do with salvation this is not Oh, a man must have a certain heart condition to be saved. No, there's nothing you can do to earn eternal salvation. There's nothing I can do to earn God's favor that he might bless me and grant me eternal salvation. But what Jesus is describing here is that God the Father has this relentless pursuit of love to all humanity in our sinfulness. And he worked through Jesus who came and lived a perfect life. And he, he works and draws us with the working of the Spirit in our lives. And he prepares us opportunity to respond in faith to the offer of life through his grace and what Jesus is talking about here is that there are some who they hear this they may not understand it but they have a sincerity a humility of hearts and they approach me in that sincerity and humility of hearts and based on this style of teaching those with that type of heart posture approach the Lord truth will always be provided and revealed. The church father said, faith that leads to understanding. You have faith on the words that he says, and as you have faith and believe on that, the Spirit illuminates the truth that you might understand something not of this world. And then also, it's beneficial as well for those who would reject it. They would never hear it or understand it anyways. And so what's fascinating here, what appears not to be gracious is in fact extremely gracious this is a grace of Jesus that he provided a shift in teaching to be of parables that the very word of God would judge man's hearts and their intentions Hebrews 4 12 the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword cutting through bone and marrow to the very soul so that when the word of God the spiritual truths of Jesus are presented should the posture of one's heart be of humility and sincerity of faith, the understanding of that truth will be provided from God the Father. So Jesus gets to verse 13 and he's telling them, wait a minute, you, you don't understand this parable? You're, you're on the inside. You, you've come to me in faith and humility and sincerity of faith. How do you not understand this? If, if you don't understand these parables, how are you going to understand all the other parables? I mean, just imagine Jesus talking them through here. But what he's getting at here is remember what got you here in the first place. See, these disciples, they were no longer on the outside, but they were on the inside as believers, followers of Jesus. And what that meant was as God in the beginning relentlessly pursued them in love, they responded in humility and sincerity. And out of that faith came understanding. And just as it says in verse 11, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, the mysterion, the mystery. Literally, these disciples who by faith pursued Jesus gained understanding that's only provided from the spiritual side of things. And then in this time, they understood the kingdom of God had these partial fulfillments, these partial inaugurations, while everyone on the outside, especially the religious leaders, expected something so much more and so much different. But Jesus, we see in verse 14, because the disciples did come to him sincerely, humbly, hey, Rabbi, we get that we need to understand this. We don't. But we believe you can explain it to us. 
So Jesus does just that as He always promises in verse 14. The sower sows the Word. So He makes clear. The sower sows the Word. He's talking about the Word of God falling on people's lives. Verse 15. And these are the ones along the path, the the road, where the Word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the Word that is sown in them. What's Jesus mean by this? What he means is those along the path where the Word of God falls upon, their hearts are hard as a result of pride. And because of pride, the Word of God falls on their lives, but has no ability to penetrate and go into their lives. And because the Word of God falls on their lives and stays there, Satan himself, Hasatan, the accuser, comes in and immediately carries out the seed of the Word of God. And they are left tragically and the hardness of their hearts, their prideful condition. Verse 16, Jesus explains the next soil. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. So there's a little more receptivity here. They receive it and there's even this enthusiasm, this joy. So the word of God is falling on these, but not just on them, but also into their lives. But notice this, verse 17 They have no root in themselves. The word of God was falling on their lives. It even penetrated inside their lives. But it never grew down and established roots for stability and security. To the point where verse 17 says they have no roots in themselves. They endure for a while out of that initial joy and spark of enthusiasm. But when tribulation Our persecution arises on account of the word. Immediately they fall away. So the first, as a result of their pride, the word of God fell on their lives, but was not in it. These next people's lives, the word of God fell on and in, but because of their influence, their persuasion of the persecution around them, the roots were never there to hold them stable based on the word of God. And then verse 18, the third soil. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Preoccupation. Word of God was falling on their lives, falling in their lives, even even growing downward to an extent with some type of root system. But then when it came for the opportunity to grow upward based on the word of God, as it began to attempt to grow upward, these lives were so preoccupied with the environment around them, too connected to the world around them, that the thorns and thistles literally choked them out. Not allowing any fruit to be yielded. So we, these, these, we see these three soils. Pride hinders the word of God. Persecution without the word of God establishing roots hinders the activity of the word of God. And then a preoccupation with the environment around us, the world around us, the world in which we live but should not be of stamps out, snuffs out, suffocates any hope of fruitfulness as the word fully intends to do. But then in verse 20, Jesus gives insight to that fourth soil. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it. Notice those first three, they only had levels of hearing it. They had the the functionality, the tool available to them to to hear it and even bring it in. But the actual acceptance of it, that was in the good soil. Where these were the ones who hear the word and accept it. And as a result of their hearing and accepting, they bear fruit. And notice, it's not fruit expected by man. It's not based on any statistics or historical data. The fruit yielded is 30-fold. 
No, 60-fold. No, even 100-fold. When someone finds their lives positioned in such a place that they don't give in to pride, they're not persuaded by persecution, they're not in a place on the third part as well that I can't remember right now. What is it? Pride, persecution, preoccupation. But instead, you're a soil that truly is prepared. It might not make sense, but you say, God, I realize you got the answer, so I'm going to humble myself and sincerely have faith in you providing the understanding. And that is a soil postured in humility and sincerity of faith for God then to fall on, to fall in, to grow downward in roots, and then to spring up a crop, a fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. When I look at today's text, there's a couple things that really terrify me. One is associated with us as believers. What this text shows, whether you realize it or not at this point, what it, what it reveals is that as believers, it is possible that as believers, your life can have the Word of God on it as that first soil. As believers, you can have, even have the Word of God in you. As believers, you can have the Word of God on you in you, and even growing downward to an extent with some type of root system. But in all that, if you never come to a place of fully accepting the totality of Scripture and all it teaches about Jesus as resurrected eternal King, if you never come to that place in the totality of that, you can have the Word of God on and in and down. But when it comes time for the opportunity for it to grow up and blossom and yield its fruits, what happens is we are preoccupied with the environment around us and we never see the full intended effect of God's Word carried out in our lives. That absolutely terrifies me. That as a believer, I might have the Word of God on me and in me and down in me. But because I'm so persuaded and preoccupied with the world around me that those thorns and briars are suffocating the fruit that God wants to bear through me as His child. It goes without saying over the last few weeks especially and also the last few months been a lot of crazy needless to say. And what I'm encountered with from Mark chapter 4, how are we doing as far as our connectedness with our environment around us and the influence of God's word and what it should be driving us toward? I think about I've got the Word of God in me. I've got the Word of God on me. I've got the Word of God growing down in me. But especially during times like COVID, especially during times like social injustices and these issues are just coming to the front and we don't know which side to pick. We don't even know to stay quiet or talk out loud because if you feel like you stay quiet, you feel like you're judged, you feel like you talk out loud, you're saying the wrong things or you can't fully sympathize or empathize one way or the other. But how are we doing based on what the Word of God shows us to do in our connectedness with this world while not being too preoccupied and missing the fruit, He wants to blossom, He wants to yield through our lives. So right now in this moment, as that weighs on my soul, I in no way am going to try to stand here before you and act like I'm an expert regarding statistics, regarding politics. But what I want to do for just a moment, not as your preacher, but as your pastor, as your shepherd, I want to share with you what I do know. This, the Word of God. What God has shown me through His Word and what we can cling to. And what we know through this, is, as Mark lends us there, as believers, we know something from Genesis, all the way from the beginning, 127. There the Trinitarian Godhead said, let us make man in our, what? Image. Man and woman, we shall make them in our image image. So regardless of stats and politics, I know for sure every man, woman, and child, every fetus at the point of conception 
is made in the image of God. Also know is that until the Lord returns, should he continue to tarry, there will always be corruption in this world. And the understatement of the day is that the result of sin stinks. It's messy. It's sticky. Because sin is heavy. It's, it's real. There's a reason it's hard to navigate. It's, it's a reason why it's hard to realize what we should say that's accurate or appropriate or what not to say and when to keep quiet. Because that's just how sin is. But what I do know is that when there's any reckless loss of life of an image bearer, whether they're crystal clean or they've got crystal in their blood, it breaks my heart. What I know is Galatians 3.28 says, there's no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's no male, there's no female. But all are one in Christ Jesus. Why is that? Not, not because the whole human race are Christians. Paul's talking about in the context of the church there. But here's what we do know from Scripture. Not from statistics, not from politics. What we know from Scripture is all humanity made in the image of God is that there's no such thing as multiple races. Made in the image of God, we are one singular human race. And if we're going to get serious about talking how this talks and acting like this acts and, and speaking and, and praying like this dictates, we recognize people groups, yes. We recognize different pigmentations, absolutely. We are all members of the singular human race. Do I endorse Black Lives Matter organization? Absolutely not. It is so tragic that such a worthy cause could have great impact, but they stand for so many things staunchly opposed to my God teaches. But don't mishear me either. I see a current event where my friends of, of that coloring, that shade, as a dear friend of mine told me this last week, and I can say this, different paint job. Right, I said it in all sincerity. I see this specific people group suffering. So I suffer with them. I lament with them. I grieve with them. But also it breaks my heart when I realize things like this because what happens is I love the escalation of attention hopefully to solve something, yes. But it breaks my heart too because I know there's my Latino brothers, my Latina sisters where it seems almost like it's only a black and white issue but it's not. There's corruption worldwide to all four corners of the globe. And my heart breaks for my Hispanic friends. My heart breaks for my yellow friends. The song I learned growing up is red and yellow, black and white. They are all precious in his sight. My heart breaks because I can't repent for someone else. We have leaders I respect who are repenting on behalf of others, telling others, I'm sorry for what so-and-so did. I would love to be able to repent on someone else's behalf. I would love to ask forgiveness for that, but I'm not perfect. You don't want me repenting on someone else's behalf because there's nothing I can offer you. I never want to present myself better than I really am. And the reality is, based on the word that has fallen in, on, and in, and down, and up in my life, is that there's only one man who's able to take the sin of the world and right all those transgressions. And his name is Jesus Christ of Nazarene. Amen? So we stand here in a super difficult, sticky, not fun time. As believers, Mark 4, I think Jesus would say the last thing he wants us to do, especially during times like this, it's come to a place where we have the word of God on our lives and in our lives and down rooted in our lives. But because we come, become so preoccupied with different agendas or stats or politics. That we're so too connected with this world that it snuffs and chokes out the fruit that God wants to bear through us as the lampstand for all humanity. If you're here this morning and you're a non-believer, as weighty as that is, what you just heard me share, 
There's something more terrifying. And what Jesus gets at in chapter 4, verses 10 to 12, that it's possible as a non-believer to come to a point in the hardness of your heart where you are locked in the hardness of your heart, your disposition that is opposed to Jesus as Lord, and there's the possibility as a non-believer with a hardness of heart in your pride to be forever locked in that hardness, never to break free with a hope of a Savior and eternal salvation. For a sticky and devastating and frustrating and gut-wrenching as the corruption of this world is. I don't act as someone ignorant, as Paul told the Thessalonians. I know my hope is beyond this world. But if you're a non-believer here today, because you're a member of the human race, you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And Scripture teaches that if you sincerely and humbly come to God the Father, believing on who Jesus said He was, the once-for-all perfect sacrifice for all humanity's sin, you shall have everlasting life. Not just for all eternity, but you shall have a purpose and a fulfillment here on this side of eternity, even in the midst of all this mess. Here's what I want you to hear. If you are here today as a non-believer, and that is one of your concerns, man, Pastor, I... I do worry that the hardness of my heart, the callous will never be chipped away. I do worry I'll never break free from this. That in and of itself is the grace of God. He has been pursuing you since before you were ever conceived. And that by that simple awareness and concern... That fear of you never breaking from that hardness of heart is the indicator, the certainty that you are not one of those. But you're here today by the drawing of God the Father that you might make a profession of faith sincerely and humbly. God, I hear you, but I don't understand you, but I want to boldly approach you in faith. Would you give me understanding that I might have life everlasting? So during this time, we're going to stand up and sing just like that precious child's already getting ready. She knows what's up. Things are crazy. There's nothing at length that I could say to, to satisfy all the different dispositions of what's going on in the world. But what I do know is I can give you this. We can cling to this. We can say, God, I want your word. God, I want it in me. I want it on me. I want, I want it below me. I want it above me. God, I don't want my own pride to, to be the pitfall of my life. I don't want the, my, my life and your word to be so shallow that when persecutions come, I'm persuaded by everything around me. I don't want anything I'm preoccupied with to get in the way of what you want to accomplish regardless of what it is. And that's where we find ourselves at this very moment. If you're a believer, you have the opportunity to seek the Father in prayer, sincerity, and humility and say, God, help me understand better so that you might produce the fruit you desire through my life, through your word. And if you're a non-believer here, listen to my heart, listen to my heart, hear me. Because you have that awareness in you at this moment, it is indication that he hasn't left you, that your hardness is not irreversible or reversible. But what scripture also teaches is that once you walk out this door, there is no guarantee when it does become irreversible. So with that, I want to invite you to stand. We're going to have one more song of worship, and it is truly an opportunity in this place, based on His Word, to respond. Maybe it is. You come down here just ask me, hey, I hear you, but I don't understand what salvation really means. I would be privileged to walk you through those next steps. Maybe it's church membership. Maybe it's a decision for baptism. Maybe God's calling you to be a part of our fellowship officially, so we run after Jesus together. Whatever it is, as we worship Let's be faithful in responding to his word in sincerity and humility. Let's stand together, church. Fathers, we're standing. May it be a, a symbol of our humbling of ourselves unto you. God, we hear a message at this time. We hear you speak into our hearts. But God, we also confess we don't understand everything. But Lord, what we know, what we can be certain of, is that this world is not enough. 
but that which Jesus accomplished on the cross through His death, burial, and resurrection will always be more than enough for us. So Lord, Spirit of Jesus in this place, would You move and prompt us to respond in a manner that pleases You. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name.